This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 19 of Prism Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by On Hiatus, Stockport, United Kingdom. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 12. Zuckthaus Bluthen. 1. A dense fog rises from the broad bosom of the Ohio. It ensnares the river banks in its mysterious embrace, veils tree and rock with sombre mist, and mocks the sun with angry frown. Within the house of death is felt the chilling breath, and all is quiet and silent in the iron cages. Only an occasional knocking as on metal disturbs the stillness. I listen intently. Nearer and more audible seem the sounds, hesitating and apparently intentional. I am involuntarily reminded of the methods of communication practised by Russian politicals, and I strive to detect some meaning in the tapping. It grows clearer as I approach the back wall of the cell, and instantly I am aware of a faint murmur in the privy. Is it fancy, or did I hear my name? Hello? I call into the pipe. The knocking ceases abruptly. I hear a suppressed, hollow voice. That you, Alec? Yes. Who is it? Never mind. You must be deaf not to hear me calling you all this time. Take that cotton out of your ears. I didn't know you could talk this way. You didn't? Well, you know now. Them's empty pipes, no stand in water, see? Fine to talk. Oh, damn it! Uh. The words are lost in the gurgle of rushing water. Presently the flow subsides, and the knocking is resumed. I bend over the privy. Hello? Hello? That you, Alec? Get off that line, you jabbering idiot! Someone shouts into the pipe. Lay down there! Take that trap out of the hole! Quit your fooling, horse thief! Hey, boys, stop that now! That's me, fellas. It's Bob, horse thief Bob. I'm talking business. Keep quiet now, will ya? Are you there, Alec? Yes? Well, pay no attention to them dubs. "'Twas that crazy south side slim that turned the water on. "'Who you calling crazy, damn you?' a voice interrupts. "'Oh, lay down, Slim, will you? Who said you was crazy? "'Nay, nay, you're bugs. "'Hey, Alec, you there?' "'Yes, Bob. "'Oh, got me name, have you? "'Yes, I'm Bob, horse thief Bob. "'Make no mistake when you see me. "'I'm Big Bob the horse thief. "'Can you hear me? It's you, Alec? "'Yes, yes. Sure it's you?' Got to tell you something. What's your number? A7. Right ya. Yeah. What cell? 6K. And this is me, Big Bob, in Windbag Bob, a heavy bass comments from above. Shut up, Curly. I'm on the line. I'm in 6F, Alec. Top tier. Call me up any time I'm in. <laughs> you see, pipes running up and down, and you can talk to any range you want, but always to the same cell as you're in. Cell 6, understand? Now, if you want to talk to cell 14, to Shorty, you know. I don't want to talk to Shorty. I don't know him, Bob. Yes, you do. You listen to what I tell you, Alec, and you'll be all right. That's me talking, Big Bob, see? Now, I say, if you'd like to choose a rag with Shorty, you just tell me. Tell Brother Bob, and he'll connect you, all right? Are you on? Know who's Shorty? No. You oughta. That's Carl. Carl Nold. Know him, don't you? What? I cry in astonishment. Is it true, Bob? Is Nold up there on your gallery? Sure thing. Cell 14. Why didn't you say so at once? You've been talking ten minutes now. Did you see him? What's your hurry, Alec? You can see him. Not just now, anyway. Perhaps by my by, maybe. There's no hurry, Alec. You got plenty of time. A few years, rather. Ha <laughs> ha. Hey there, horse thief. Quit that. I recognize Curly's deep bass. What do you want to make the kid feel bad for? No harm meant, Curly, Bob returns. I was just joshing him a bit. Well, quit it. You don't mind it, Alec, do you? I hear Bob again, his tones softened. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm your friend, Alec. You can bet your corn dodge around that. Say, I've got something for you from Shorty. I mean, Carl, you savvy? What have you, Bob? Nixie through the hole. Ain't safe. I'm coffee boy on this here range. I'll sneak round to you in the morning when I go to fetch me can of bootleg. Now, jiggeroo! Screw's coming. Footnote 37. 
Jigaru, Lookout. End of footnote. 2. The presence of my comrades is investing existence with interest and meaning. It has brought to me a breeze from the atmosphere of my former environment. It is stirring the graves where lie my soul's dead into renewed life and hope. The secret exchange of notes lends colour to the routine. It is like a fresh mountain streamlet joyfully rippling through a stagnant swamp. At work in the shop my thoughts are engrossed with our correspondence. Again and again I review the arguments, elucidating to my comrades the significance of my attentat. They too are inclined to exaggerate the importance of the purely physical result. The exchange of views gradually ripens our previously brief and superficial acquaintance into closer intimacy. There is something in Karl Nold that especially attracts me. I sense in him a congenial spirit. His spontaneous frankness appeals to me. My heart echoes his grief at the realisation of most some pardonable behaviour. But the ill-concealed antagonism of Bauer is irritating. It reflects his desperate clinging to the shattered idol. Presently, however, a better understanding begins to manifest itself. The big, jovial German has earned my respect. He braved the anger of the judge by consistently refusing to betray the man who aided him in distribution of the anarchist leaflet among the homestead workers. On the other hand, both Karl and Henry appreciate my efforts on the witness stand to exonerate them from complicity in my act. Their condemnation as acknowledged anarchists was, of course, a foregone conclusion, and I am gratified to learn that neither of my comrades had entertained any illusions concerning the fate that awaited them. Indeed, both have expressed surprise that the maximum revenge of the law was not visited upon them. Their philosophical attitude exerts a soothing effect upon me. Karl even voices satisfaction that the sentence of five years will afford him a long-needed vacation from many years of ceaseless factory toil. He is facetiously anxious lest capitalist industry be handicapped by the loss of such a splendid carpenter as Henry, whom he good-naturedly chaffs on the separation from his newly affianced. The evening hours have ceased to drag. There is pleasure and diversion in the correspondence. The notes have grown into bulky letters, daily cementing our friendship. We compare views, exchange impressions, and discuss prison gossip. I learn the history of the movement of the Twin Cities, the personnel of anarchist circles, and collect a fund of anecdotes about Albrecht, the philosophic old shoemaker whose diminutive shop in Allegheny is the centre of the radical intelligentsia. With deep contrition, Bauer confesses how narrowly he escaped the role of my executioner. My unexpected appearance in their midst, at the height of the homestead struggle, had waked suspicion among the Allegheny comrades. They sent an inquiry to most, whose reply proved a warning against me. Unknown to me, Bauer shared the room I occupied in Nold's house. Through the long hours of the night he lay awake with revolver cocked. At the first sign of a suspicious move on my part, he had determined to kill me. The personal tenor of our correspondence is gradually broadening into the larger scope of socio-political theories, methods of agitation, and applied tactics. The discussions, prolonged and often heated, absorb our interest. The bulky notes necessitate greater circumspection. The difficulty of procuring writing materials assumes a serious aspect. Every available scrap of paper is exhausted. Margins of stray newspapers and magazines have been penciled on, the contents repeatedly erased, and the frayed tatters microscopically covered with ink. Even an occasional flyleaf from library books has been sacrilegiously forced to leave its covers, and every evidence of its previous association dexterously removed. The problem threatens to terminate our correspondence, and fills us with dismay. But the genius, our faithful postman, of proud horse-thieving proclivities, proves equal to the occasion. Bob constitutes himself our commissary, designating the broom shop in which he is employed as the base of our future supplies. The unexpected affluence fills us with joy. The big rolls requisitioned by horse-thief exclude the fear of famine. The smooth yellow wrapping paper affords the luxury of larger and more legible chirography. The pride of sudden wealth germinates ambitious projects. We speculate on the possibility of converting our correspondence into a magazinelet and wax warm over the proposed lists of readers. 
Before long, the first issue of the Zuchthausbluthen. Footnote 38. Zuchthausbluthen. Prison Blossoms. End of footnote. Is greeted with the encouraging approval of our sole subscriber, whose contribution surprises us in the form of a rather creditable poem on the last blank page of the publication. Elated at the happy acquisition, we unanimously crown him Meistersinger, with dominion over the Department of Poetry. Soon we plan more pretentious issues. The outward size of the publication is to remain the same, three by five inches, but the number of pages is to be enlarged, each issue to have a different editor to ensure equality of opportunity, the readers to serve as contributing editors. The appearance of the blue, then, is to be regulated by the time required to complete the circle of readers, whose identity is to be masked with certain initials to protect them against discovery. Henceforth, Bauer, physically a giant, is to be known as G. Because of my medium stature, I shall be designated with the letter M, and knolled as the smallest by K. Footnote 39. K. Initial of the German Klein. Small. End of footnote. The poet, his history somewhat shrouded in mystery, is christened D for Dichter. M. K. G. are to act in turn as editor in chief, whose province it is to start the Blutheren on its way, each reader contributing to the issue till it is returned to the original editor to enable him to read and comment upon his fellow contributors. The publication, its contents growing transit, is finally to reach the second contributor, upon whom will devolve the editorial management of the following issue. The unique arrangement proves a source of much pleasure and recreation. The little magazine is rich in contents and varied in style. The diversity of handwriting heightens the interest and stimulates speculation on the personality of our increasing readers' contributors. In the arena of the diminutive publication, there rages the conflict of contending social philosophies. Here, a political essay rubs elbow with a witty anecdote, and a dissertation on the nature of things is interspersed with prison small talk and personal reminiscence. Flashes of unstudied humour and unconscious rivalry of orthography lend peculiar charm to the unconventional editorials, and waft a breath of Josh Billings into the manuscript pages. But the success of the Zuchthaus Bluthen soon discovers itself a veritable Frankenstein, which threatens the original foundation and aims of the magazinelet. The popularity of joint editorship is growing at the cost of unity and tendency. The bard's astonishing facility at versification, coupled with his Jules Vernian imagination, causes us grave anxiety, lest his untamable Pegasus traverse the limits of our paper supply. The appalling warning of the commissary that the improvident drain upon his resources is about to force him on a strike imperatively calls a halt. We are deliberating policies of retrenchment and economy, when unexpectedly the arrival of two homestead men suggests an auspicious solution. 3. The presence of Hugh F. Dempsey and Robert J. Beattie, prominent in the Knights of Labour organisation, offers opportunity for propaganda among workers representing the more radical element of American labour. Accused of poisoning the food served to the strike-breakers in the mills, Dempsey and Beatty appear to me men of unusual type. Be they innocent or guilty, the philosophy of their methods is in harmony with revolutionary tactics. Labour can never be unjust in its demands. Is it not the creator of all wealth in the world? Every weapon may be employed to return the despoiled people into its rightful ownership. Is not the terrorising of scabbery, and ultimately of the capitalist exploiters, an effective means of aiding the struggle? Therefore Dempsey and Beatty deserve a claim. Morally certain of their guilt, I respect them the more for it, though I am saddened by their denial of complicity in the scheme of wholesale extermination of the scabs. The black leg is also human, it is true, and desires to live, but one should starve rather than turn traitor to the cause of his class. Moreover, the individual, or any number of them, cannot be weighed against the interests of humanity. Infinite patience weaves the threads that bring us in contact with the imprisoned labour leaders. In the ceaseless duel of vital need against stupidity and malice, caution and wit are sharpened by danger. The least indiscretion, the most trifling negligence means discovery, disaster, 
But perseverance and intelligent purpose conquer. By the aid of the faithful horse thief, communication with Dempsey and Beatty is established. With the aggressiveness of strong conviction, I present to them my views dwelling on the historic role of the attentator and the social significance of conscious individual protest. The discussion ramifies, the interest aroused soon transcending the limits of my paper supply. Presently I am involved in a correspondence with several men, whose questions and misinterpretations regarding my act I attempt to answer and correct with individual notes. But the method proves an impossible tax on our opportunities, and KGM finally decide to publish an English edition of the Zuchthaus Bluthen. The German magazine let is suspended, and in its place appears the first issue of the Prison Blossoms. End of section 19. Recording by On Hiatus, Stockport, United Kingdom. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchists.